you're good to go. Okay, great. Thanks, Allie. Uh, welcome, everybody, for today's uh, Lunch and Learn. I, we just came off an NCERN CFO revenue cycle meeting, and we did that from 9 until about 10.30 this morning. And typically during those meetings, I do a, a fairly extensive uh, a recap of what's going on with the Affordable Care Act and what's happening in Washington. Of course, there's been so much discussion uh, recently and so much interest placed on that and what's happening with Washington with regards to the replace and repeal of uh, the Affordable Care Act slash Obamacare. We didn't actually talk about it this morning because I I'd, I'd encouraged the uh, roundtable members to join us for today's lunch and learn at noon. But nonetheless, I wanted just to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Washington and uh, get Dina's perspective since she's our lobbyist. And Dina, at any time, feel free to uh, jump in with any comments that you have. But I uh, wanted to just talk a little bit about what's happening um, with the Affordable Care Act and what the, uh, uh, the progress is and any type of efforts to uh, uh, replace or repeal it. And as you all know, it is stalled out. Uh, the most latest action was the so-called skinny repeal bill that was uh, considered by the U.S. Senate uh, early on July 28th. And in fact, early in the morning of July 28th, about 1.30 in the morning, uh, the Senate was unable to uh, pass the uh, so-called skinny repeal bill. There were three Republican senators, uh, two that have been opposed to the uh, any actions related to the repeal and replace from the outset. And then uh, Senator John McCain, who, who had made a very impassioned uh, speak, speech earlier in the week about uh, the importance of bipartisanship within the Senate. Those three had voted against it. We'll talk about that in greater detail in a second. But the uh, skinny repeal bill was really the last action that Congress, or the Senate in this case, had looked at um, any type of uh, repeal action of the Affordable Care Act. It was defeated 51 to 49, and in fact, uh, Vice President Pence was in the chamber prepared to make the, to cast the tying vote had that uh, happened. Uh, of course, that did not occur. Uh, the, the skinny repeal bill, as it was, had, two, had three major provisions to it. One was to repeal the individual mandate that was part of the Affordable Care Act, and it had actually uh, uh, successfully uh, got through the uh, U.S. Supreme Court in 2012 when, when there was con constitutional issues about the appropriateness of uh, the individual mandate and whether Congress could uh, mandate any type of uh, action in that regard, and the Supreme Court did uphold that by a 5-4 to four vote. Jim, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, yes. S West Six, whoever is logged on as S West Six, you have uh, been sharing your screen off and on. Let's say we're seeing your emails, so you may want to uh, be careful that you're you're not sharing your screen with the group. Okay, thanks, Allie. Uh, in addition to the individual mandate, there was uh, the other two major provisions that were included in the skinny repeal bill was the employer mandate uh, that was. Uh, that required uh, employers of uh, larger uh, companies, 50 or more employees, to provide health insurance or face uh, tax penalties. Uh, that repeal or that uh, elimination of the employer mandate was also part of the skinny repeal bill, as was the uh, medical device excise tax, uh, which was a 2.3% excise tax against any uh, medical device uh, revenues. And that was particularly important in Indiana because Indiana is one of the major uh, medical device uh, centers in the state. In fact, uh, there's two major areas in Indiana that create and market and uh, produce medical devices. One is the Warsaw area, and the other one is uh, in Bloomington with Cook. And uh, Indiana has all along, the congressional delegation has been very opposed to the medical device tax uh, because of the uh, implications that it has on the local economy and in, in those major medical device producers in Warsaw and Bloomington. And in fact, uh, it created some very interesting uh, bedfellows uh, opposed to the tax. Uh, one was uh, Senator Al Franken, who is the very liberal senator from the state of Minnesota, and, uh, and Todd Young and, and, um, and other uh, conservative uh, members of the Indiana delegation were all in bed with together on the, opposing the medical device because of the impact locally uh, that the medical device would have on the local Indiana or in this case Minnesota economies since those are two major players in the medical device industry. 
Um, with the with the defeat of the skinny repeal bill uh, on July 28th, really Congress uh, is going to have to go back and look at bipartisan situation bipartisan discussions to determine how they're going to proceed with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it, the uh, Democrats have all along said there were problems with the Affordable Care Act, and we're seeing we're seeing a reduced number of insurers nationwide. Uh, in fact, in Indiana, we, we discussed earlier today that there will be four counties, uh, two in northern Indiana and two in the southwest corner of the state, that will actually have no insurers for those particular uh, uh, residents of those particular counties that will not have access to insure at this point that have, a, that have filed for insurance, uh, issuing insurance for 2018. Uh, with Anthem's pullout in Indiana, and in Ohio, you, you also saw significant reductions in the availability of insurance in the state of Ohio as well. Um, if, you, if you back up just for a second, all of this kind of started uh, downhill about May 4th when the uh, U.S. House narrowly passed what was known as the American Health Care Act, uh, which had actually 20 GOP uh, representatives vote against it. So it, it, was, it passed but by a very, very narrow margin, very similar to when the Affordable Care Act passed originally in 2010, it had a very narrow passage as well. Um, back in May, when the House passed, the, passed its version, uh, there was considerable conservative op opposition to the quote Obamacare, calling it Obamacare light. Uh, they had concerns about the uh, tax increases, how the subsidies from the federal government would be, would be funded, uh, in moderate opposition to the uh, original AHCA Act uh, really stemmed on concerns about the Medicaid expansion, how the, the proposed use of uh, funding states for Medicaid through block grants. Uh, there was concerns about the loss of insured lives. Uh, so moderate opposition uh, on the GOP side uh, was very vocal about it. And the, the Congressional Budget Office, shortly after it, the adoption of the uh, American Health Care Act by the House came out with some pretty startling statistics indicating that uh, the bill as it was proposed and would move on to the Senate would, would uh, uh, cost about 22 million Americans to lose their health insurance as it was written. And although there was positive news that it would help uh, reduce the federal deficit in the tune of about 400, million, uh, 400 billion dollars. Um, when the Senate uh, started its its consideration of, of the uh, of a parallel bill that was known as the Better Care Reconciliation Act. Uh, it had right from the outset five Republican senators that were opposed to it, and, uh, and it, those uh, five included Senator Collins and Senator Murkowski, Collins from Maine and Murkowski from Alaska. Those five senators, along with Ted Cruz and a few others, uh, felt that felt that uh, here again along conservative and moderate lines, uh, Ted Cruz uh, felt that, it had, that the uh, Senate version had not gone enough to, to end the Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. And the moderates were here again more concerned about the impact on Medicaid and what it meant to states that already had expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. When, um, when uh, the uh, Senate looked at um, uh, taking that particular bill to the floor, uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate, the GOP leader in the Senate, realized that he didn't have enough votes and pulled consideration of the vote uh, before it actually went to the floor to, uh, to avoid any type of embarrassment for the Senate leadership and for the president. Um, that led to the decision to come back with what's known as the, or was known as the Health Care Freedom Act, the so-called skinny repeal bill, which then again was defeated in Ju on July 28th. Um, What's next now? Well, Congress is scheduled to take its uh, annual August recess next week. They're generally off between now and Labor Day. And people raise concerns about, well, why are they taking time off at this point when there's so many things that they have to face? Well, it's actually historical that they've done this. Uh, they've always taken uh, uh, the latter half of August off, and it goes back to the early days of, of, the, of the country when uh, there was no air conditioning, and it was too hot for uh, members of Congress to meet in these co closed confined uh, cat or these closed confinements because it was just too hot in Washington, and it would cause problems with debate. And they felt that there would be legislation that would get through uh, that would be passed more on the 
uh, under passion trying to get out of there because of the heat of the building rather than have careful consideration of what they were passing. So Congress will be uh, recessing here for about two weeks through Labor Day, and then they've got to come back uh, through the months of September and October with some really key stuff to discuss. One is to if they're going to take up a uh, health care reform, uh, any type of legislation, they've got to look at bipartisan solutions to that. Then they've got a couple other items they've really got to talk about that have been part of the that were part of the Republican campaign promises for the election in 2016. One was tax reform, and the other one was uh, they have to adopt a budget and raise the debt ceiling uh, October 1st, so that for the federal government to continue to operate as of October 1st, when the uh, new federal fiscal year begins. As you recall, in the past, when they've had problems with any type of debt ceiling or or uh, allowed for the budget to pass in October, as of October 1st, uh, there have been closures uh, of, of federal facilities, most notably among the, the national parks, when they were unable to fund uh, fund the federal government. So that so the Congress has to come to some agreement by basically September 30th to make sure the government continues to run as of September 30th. So that's kind of a recap. From my perspective, Dean, anything you would like to add that, that I've stated already? Um, just a couple of real quick things, Jim. Um, recognizing that the senators and representatives are home right now on the recess, I think it's really important that um, our members know that now is a great time to, um, if you don't have a relationship started with your senators, um, and or your representative that um, going in with cold asks is never a good idea. Um, having these relationships, developing these relationships, nurturing these relationships um, is extremely important, um, not just when the proverbial challenges um, are, are which are constant in our in our world, but um, not just when challenges occur. So I would encourage each of them to um, reach out to their representatives, reach out to the senators, see if see when they're um, going to be in the areas, see if there's opportunities for dialogue. Be sure to answer questions that these folks might have. But also, um, and probably more importantly, when you are speaking with them, make sure that you share things that are um, relevant to what's going on in and around the health care bill. Um, make sure that they understand what your um, Medicaid and Medicare numbers look like. If you have an absorbently high population um, of Medicaid, Make sure that you're chatting with your CFOs um, and, and understand what those numbers are. Understand what, your, what the positive impacts are um, of when the HIP 2.0 expansion took place and be able to share um, success stories in and around what those numbers have meant to your facility. Um, be sure and be able to, to talk about what the competition in your rural market is. Um, or if there is no competition with regards to um, the expansion of the ACA. Uh, talk about what the premiums look like for your constituents. No doubt that there's someone within the, con the confines of your building that can, that can talk to and specifically around that. Um, help them understand what uh, Medicare cuts would mean to your facility. And talk about it in terms of not just sheer numbers, but programs. If you would have to remove a program from your facility because of the cuts, help them really wrap their arms around what that would mean to the population that you're serving. Um, trying to think about uh, what other things that, that are, are really important for our folks to, to really understand about um, how imperative these recesses are Jim, there may be something that, that I've missed in, in my uh, brief comments here um, that maybe you want to share. Well, the, the only thing that kind of that jumped to my mind was th these uh, members of Congress will be facing some town halls recently coming up that could be uh, pretty critical. So if you have a town hall in your area, certainly uh, consider attending that. They'll be, face they'll be facing some heat, particularly the Republicans facing some heat from 
of their constituents because of some of the campaign promises, particularly on the healthcare side, that have not been met. So those have been pretty contentious, and I've seen, I'm sure you've seen that on the news. Uh, but to give them credit, uh, the members of Congress do face the music and go to these town halls knowing that they're probably going to face some pretty heavy opposition and criticism. I would agree completely, Jim. Okay. All right, do we want to move to more of a local uh, perspective? Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, outcome of the 2017 session of the Indiana General Assembly. And and I would like to add that, uh, okay, good. Allie's putting up the uh, uh, the latest and greatest, what I call General Assembly Bill Watch. And we'll get to this in just a few minutes. But I wanted to just kind of highlight uh, some of the outcomes of the General Assembly session. And then we're going to look at some specific bills. And it's not going to be a tremendous amount that we'll look at, but I did want to highlight a few bills that will be of particular interest in enacted acts that will, uh, uh, will have, that would have taken effect as of July 1st. Um, the uh, session always, of course, this was the long session after the election. Uh, the, ses the sessions after elections are always the long session that run through, typically through the middle of April. And then this coming session on 2018 uh, will be the so-called short session. And cynically, uh, the, the General Assembly has set that schedule uh, so that they can adjourn in 2018, uh, as according to the short session, so they can begin their, op their plans for re-election for not only in the May primary, but for the November election that will occur in 2018. And as you can imagine, there's already people lining up both at the uh, state and federal level. We've, we've heard about, uh, about five or six different uh, possible uh, senatorial candidates uh, running against Joe Donnelly for election next uh, November, two of whom are already in the U.S. House, and there have been and some other members of the General Assembly uh, who are uh, considering runs or have announced runs against Donnelly next uh, next year. But in, as far as the Indiana General Assembly goes, uh, Eric Holcomb, who generally has been uh, pretty well regarded by uh, both sides of the aisle, the Democrats and the Republicans feel that. He did a nice job during the session setting the tone for the election. And I think right now, uh, Governor Holcomb is, is enjoying a, a fairly good home, uh, home or a honeymoon with the, the General Assembly based on some of his policies and what he had projected and what his proposals were uh, in, in preparation for the 2017 session. The session kicked off with the annual State of the State Address early in the session where uh, Governor Holcomb had five major pillars that he wanted to uh, get through the General Assembly or concerns that the uh, General Assembly would address. One was to cultivate, cultivate a strong and diverse economy to ensure that Indiana maintains a magnet for jobs. Two was to fund a long-term roads and bridges plan uh, that takes advantages of our location. And as, as the session moved along, that really became the major focus uh, of the General Assembly and the budget that ultimately passed. Uh, three was to develop a 21st century skilled and ready workforce. Four was to attack the drug epidemic that we're all facing in, throughout the state. And five, uh, more from a, from a kind of a high perspective, provide great government service at a great value to taxpayers. So those were the five pillars that the governor outlined in his state of a state dress, which happened in early January. I think the one thing that, that the governor has been successful in doing, I think that's why he's enjoying some uh, uh, bipartisan support and getting some plaudits from, from the Democratic side of the aisle is that as part of his, as part of his plan in the state of a state address, he stayed away from some of the uh, so-called social issues uh, that has plagued prior administrations and trying to pass and has created some problems on both sides of the aisle and trying to get some uh, uh, success with the General Assembly and caused a very contentious sessions as has happened in the past. Um, overall, this session was identified as the infrastructure session. There were 1,261 bills that were introduced, uh, 271 that were adopted or enacted. So that's what you're seeing on your screen uh, is just a snapshot of the 271 uh, that were actually, uh, or the 1,261 that were introduced and, and 271 that were enacted. The, the biggest news that came out of the 2017 session uh, was the 1.2 billion annual revenues that were by uh, uh, that were assigned for 
uh, by 2024 for roads and bridges through a tax increase on gasoline, uh, increasing the gasoline tax by 10 cents from 18 cents a gallon to 28 cents a gallon, and the, the uh, $15 increase in registration fees that uh, you may have noticed if you've gotten your plates recently at the B&B. Uh, those two tax increases, and you know, generally people don't like tax increases, but uh, identifying the need to improve the infrastructure uh, throughout the state as a result of what transpired on I-65 through Tippecanoe County a couple years ago, there was the need to upgrade our infrastructure, particularly as it has a significant impact, the highway system has a significant impact on the commerce for this state. Um, also, uh, there was, uh, in keeping with the uh, uh, governor's five bill, uh, five major pillars that he announced during his state of a state. Uh, a $32 billion biennial budget was adopted by the General Assembly, which included $1.9 billion in reserves, the so-called rainy day funds. Uh, that's always kind of a contentious amount of money. Some people uh, want to get into that saying, hey, we can fund additional education, we're going to fund additional social programs. Others are more conservative and say, hey, if there's a downturn in the economy that, uh, that, that will help fund state government, kind of depends on your per, per personal uh, political persuasion on what you believe that the, the uh, rainy day fund should be used for. Um, the budget also included uh, funding increases for education, for public safety, and fighting the opiate drug epidemic. Uh, it increased uh, ki uh, kindergarten through 12 funding by $345 million and the state universities by 91.3 million. It included pay raises for the uh, state police, which the governor had uh, advocated during, during his state of the state address. And it also included uh, t an additional $10 million uh, to be used by the uh, drug czar, the so-called drug czar, to battle the opiate epidemic that's facing this state. And then lastly, a fairly controversial uh, program, which was to expand the pre-K program throughout the state that's been under criticism and been under scrutiny for a number of folks, by a number of legislators and political observers. Uh, there was an additional 22 million that was allocated to expand the pre-K program and added, uh, went from the uh, pilot program with five to now 20 counties statewide. And ultimately, advocates of the pre-K program want to uh, go all 92 counties, but the program as it is in place and as currently funded is for 20 counties in the state of Indiana. So from a high perspective, that's kind of where we're at. Dean, anything you want to add before we look at some individual bills? Did we lose Dina? All right. Sorry, Jim, I was on mute. Um, oh, that's fine. I, I think it's just really important to note that um, Governor Holcomb did a, a, a really um, bold um, notion when he recognized in his state of the state address um, that Indiana has a drug epidemic. Uh, I'm sure many of our members uh, recall when, um, when then sitting Governor Pence um, was very, I, I hate to use the word dismissive, but that's really what he was uh, with regards to the challenges um, in place here within the state. So uh, I just want to want to make note that that Governor Holcomb um, without much fanfare uh, and with Matt, without much um, reservation immediately um, took note and said this is something that is definitely on his radar and he uh, ultimately then um, put in place um, a, a drug czar if you will in um, Jim McCollum um, and um, I think it's, we're seeing some efforts move forward. There's not been a lot of movement yet, but I know that there's been a lot of information gathering um, through that office, and um, I'm eagerly anticipating specific materials coming through that office uh, here in the next couple of months that should help um, not only our rural constituents, but our rural facilities maybe wrap their arms around some of the challenges that they're seeing around the heroin and, and opioid epidemic. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Alec, can we scroll back up to the top of the bill watch? Sure. I just kind of wanted to show people the, uh, the magnitude of the document you've put together. Oh, okay. And also to let everyone know, uh, if you send me your email address again through that chat function, 
I will provide my email address right now. It's Indiana, er, A Orwig at Indiana RHA.org, A O R W I G at Indiana.org. Uh, if you shoot me a quick email, I'm happy to share this document with you as well. Thanks, Allie. And the uh, roundtables that I chair, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, CFO roundtable, materials management, pharmacy, and human resources have seen this document. We, we talked about this uh, during our most recent roundtable meeting. Uh, but basically to, to talk a little bit about, you know, what some of the bills and what and we talked about during the session as a recap to the session itself. So this thing is kind of laid out from left to right. You can see the bill number uh, uh, starting in the left column, a, a very generic title about the bill, what committee it was originally signed to, uh, if it had action in that particular committee, which would be the second reading. Now that the second reading means that the committee actually took action on it. Uh, third reading meeting went, went to the actual floor of that particular chamber, and then it would move on to the second chamber, uh, assigned to the committee in that particular chamber, any action that it did in the, the second reading uh, in that committee, and then so forth. And then over on the uh, far right, you see a, a brief description about what that particular uh, bill was about. And obviously, there's um, if you were to actually go out onto the uh, uh, indiana.gov website, you can see a lot more information about these particular bills. But I just wanted to kind of give a recap of how these look um, in terms of um, you know how they how they how they per proceeded or how they progressed through the uh, through the general assembly uh, starting in January through the April fifteenth uh, adjournment date. So what I'd like to do is highlight the ones that are in yellow. I think these are the ones that are of particular interest from from a variety of perspectives. The first one is uh, what was known as Senate Bill fifty one. It was Related to immunizations provided by pharmacists, um, the the uh, it started in the Health and Provider Services uh, Committee, moved on through the the Senate uh, with having bipartisan support. You can see that it passed the committee eleven to one, and then it actually passed the full Senate forty six to three. Uh, widespread support uh, for, the, for this particular bill went on into the House, and here again had widespread uh, support in the. Uh, in the House Public Health Committee and on the floor, the governor signed it on April 21st. And basically what this bill enacted action does, as of 7-1, uh, 17, it allowed pharmacists to expand the type of immunizations that they are under their license able to provide. This would include MMRs, the measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, hep A, hep B, and HIBs. Uh, this was allowed the pharmacists to do this. We talked about this during the pharmacy uh, uh, roundtable about how in the hospital they are now under their licensure and by the by this uh, in, by this enacted bill able to provide those uh, immunizations upon request. All right, I want to scroll down. Jim, can I speak to this one really quickly? Yeah, sure. Um, I would just like to to make everybody aware that this includes the pharmacist at private pharmacies as well as large commercial pharmacies, so your Walmarts and your CVSs. So I don't know what kind of education you might have for um, new parents um, through your, if you still are providing OB services um, or if you have any kinds of pediatric uh, practitioners, but um, your constituents can take their children to get these vaccinations and it would, I would encourage you and, and it would behoove these patients to make sure that they keep track of where their children are getting immunized and where they've gotten these immunizations at. Um, I don't, like I say, I don't know if that's a service that you're currently providing, but they just need to recognize that um, if they've gotten them at the county health department before, then their, the ability to track these has been really easy. If they've gotten them within the um, primary care physician offices, they've been really easy to track and maintain. But if you go to an independent pharmacist, I'm not sure exactly what kind of tracking materials that they will have in place, nor how easy it would be for a parent to go back and recover uh, what immunizations were given to their child and on what dates. 
We did actually have a question come in regarding the immunizations. Jim, uh, I'm not sure if you have this answer or not, but someone is wondering, will the pharmacists be entering the immunizations on CHIRP? That would, to answer, to, to answer that question, I don't know specifically if that will be required in CHIRP. It would, be in the, it would be specifically addressed in the bill itself. So um, here again, uh, the the uh, the bill. It's the language in the final bill that was adopted would be available out on the Indiana.gov website. And if you look at it, would be uh, the Senate enact or the actual Senate uh, S enacted 51 bill. You could see particular language and what is required required specifically about that bill. Getting down into the detail. What I'm trying to do here is just kind of give you a very highlight about what transpired on some individual bills. Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, one thing I also want to, if we're looking at uh, 151 here in just a second, if you notice that right above there, like 147, 134, notice that those died in committee. That means that they were introduced by some member, and here again, out on the website, you can see who actually introduced the bill, but it never made it out of those particular committees. Chances are it may be readdressed or reintroduced in the next session, but uh, these were primarily related to health care, and so we put them on the bill watch to see if there was any action that took place during the session. And obviously, uh, examples of 133, 134, 147 died in committee, never even got uh, to a vote within the committee. So the, the uh, chairman of those particular committees uh, didn't even uh, bring it to a vote. Uh, Senate Bill 151 is the INSPECT prescription database. Uh, as you can see, widespread support in both the, the House and, and starting in the Senate and moving over to the House. In fact, there was no member of the General Assembly that voted against this. And this particular uh, act requires uh, registering in the, uh, the INSPECT database when a patient is entering into a pain management program. And I think the thing I wanted to bring into discussion real quick about the INSPECT program I attended a, a meeting about a month and a half ago when they were first releasing the uh, initial report on the opiate epidemic. Uh, Dina referred to uh, Mr. McClellan, who's the drug czar, when he made his first uh, uh, preliminary findings that the, that the uh, committee had been working on. Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about the INSPECT database and how it needs to be better utilized by providers in the state of Indiana. And there was a statistic somewhere to the effect of about 48% of registrations or, or entries are taking place, meaning that the database is not being fully utilized for the purposes of which it's intended. This would obviously uh, require, at least for uh, any type of prescriptions involving ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, those controlled substances, that there has to be requirements uh, to enter that into the inspect database to make it more robust and valid. Uh, Dean, anything you'd like to add to that? I know you talked a little bit about Inspect earlier. Yeah, Inspect is a really, really big deal. So I can't impress upon you how big of a deal it is. Um, they, are, they, are, they have implemented this program. They are not just targeting physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs, but they are also targeting uh, physicians um, who are prescribing opioids um, to utilize it, as Jim noted. 48% uh, of uh, providers have gone in and registered, but there's only about a 22% utilization rate. Um, I would not be surprised if they are not watching this extremely closely to see who um, around the state has prescriptive authority um, and have not signed in yet. Um, and um, who is not utilizing this on a regular basis. Because of the magnitude of the epidemic that we are seeing, I would not be surprised that if people don't seriously start um, utilizing this and taking advantage of INSPECT, if there's not some kind of repercussions um, that could potentially be administered um, in the 2018 session. So if you've not had the conversation with your um, providers um, who have prescriptive authority to go in and register, please, please, please do that. Encourage them to get themselves registered, 
to utilize the inspect program i know it's probably cumbersome i know we're asking a lot of these folks but in the long term i think that they will be um there will be safeguards for those who have who go in and do that and i would hate to see any, anybody in rural penalized for not utilizing a tool that is uh, readily available for them and um, it wouldn't surprise me either if the attorney general um, is not would not be watching folks who are not using inspect to see if maybe that they're not um, doing um, a little bit more aggressive prescribing practices which would make them a target as well so um, please encourage your folks to use the inspect program okay thanks can we scroll down a little bit to the next one next yellow one 226 there we go good uh, 226 was a Senate bill uh, regarding prescribing and dispensing of opiates and if you look across you can see that uh, there was minor opposition to it on the Senate floor but for the most part particularly in the House there was widespread support for this particular bill uh, that uh, some about the amount of opiates that a prescriber can uh, can uh, prescribe and the issue was that the the, the, the contention was that is this somewhat limiting a, a uh, prescriber's ability to take care of a patient uh, as patient care, but with you know, consistent with the governor's pillars and with all that's transpiring in, in the state of Indiana and nationwide with the opiate epidemic, uh, the General Assembly did come down with some uh, requirements on, on the limitation of opiates that uh, prescribers may issue. And if you're looking at these details about that here again, Indiana.gov, this would be Senate Enacted Act uh, 226. Dina? Again, um, you, can, you can see within Jim's um, wonderful spreadsheet the um, number of opioid uh, related bills that were uh, introduced uh, into the Senate this last session. And um, this specific bill, without calling anybody out, uh, recognized that there were, there were um, some practices of over-prescribing going on. And uh, while physicians do have the ultimate prescriptive authority, they know their patients best, um, this bill is to support the efforts of those physicians who are getting um, may be pressured uh, by some of their constituents for the 30-day supply to be able to say, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you. Uh, our state legislator ha legislation legislators have put um, some uh, provisions in place, and this is all that I can give to you. So um, it's not meant to be burdensome. It's meant to be a supportive effort um, for those who um, maybe had some challenges saying no in the past or not recognizing uh, what they were uh, potentially exposing their patients to. Okay, good. All right, want to scroll down to the next one, Allie? 408. 408 is a, here again a, a, a bill that was enacted regarding uh, use of the INSPECT program. We talked quite a bit about INSPECT already. And I think what's one thing I want to point out here, I think is, is somewhat relevant. If you go across from, from starting in the Senate and moving through the House, you see that there was absolute total support of this particular action. And I think uh, oftentimes the General Assembly or even Congress is criticized because of all the contentionness and fighting that goes on between the two parties. And, and here's an example of where they were in total agreement. They felt that there was something that needed to be done to bolster the use and the appropriateness and the, and the expansion of the INSPECT program. And this had bipartisan support. So I don't think always, you know, maybe it's just when there's bills that are contentious and there's fighting between the two parties that gets all the pub. This is an example of where there is a camaraderie and there is a collegial or act efforts among uh, members of our General Assembly and or Congress to really do something that is good for the overall uh, population. So here again, this particular is an extension of the uh, expansion and use of the INSPECT program. Dean, anything that you'd like to talk about in addition to we've already talked about with INSPECT? I believe so, Jim. Thanks. Okay. All right. I'm going to roll on to the next one. 
Okay, getting into the latter part of the bills on the Senate side, uh, this 446 was a, an effort consistent with the governor's pillar about fighting the epidemic, the opiate epidemic. Uh, here again, uh, complete bipartisan support with uh, Senate Bill 446 to establish a, a recovery program for pregnant women or women with uh, newborns uh, with the residential facilities uh, followed up by home in-home visits for, for women who are battling opiate addiction, particularly if they're in a situation where they're with children or about to have children. Uh, recognizing the importance of a residential program to meet those needs, because as we all know, just because a woman is pregnant doesn't mean she doesn't have a problem, a potential problem with the opiate addiction. Anything you'd like to add, Dina? No, this is uh, something that, um a lot of our rural caucus members uh, heard specifics from um, Craig Kenyon and his group from Reed Hospital spoke about the number of uh, neonatal um, challenges that they were facing uh, on the east side of the state. And uh, it really resonated with uh, much of our rural caucus members. Um, so not surprised at all that this bill uh, found its way to the floor and passed with great success. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, we move on into the House, and the only, uh, there's only actually one constitutional requirement of the Indiana General Assembly, and that is to pass a budget every two years. All this other stuff they do is in addition to the main function of the General Assembly, which is to pass a budget. Uh, they are required to do so every two years as a biennial budget, uh, and this year, as you can see, and going across, starting in the budget always starts in the House Ways and Means Committee and then uh, has significant uh, discussions and amendments and revisions that take place in the Senate. Uh, I think what's probably most of most interest in this particular budget was the final budget that was uh, got through the Appropriations Committee that was uh, chaired by uh, Senator Luke uh, Kinley, who is retiring from that from the Senate after this session. Uh, so we'll have a new appropriations uh, chair for the for the you know, for the future. Kinley has always been someone who has been fairly opposed to any tax increases, uh, but I think it is noteworthy that this particular budget, which did include some tax increases on the gasoline side and obviously with the BMV fees uh, for the road road and bridges project, did include some tax um, increases that Senator uh, Kinley typically is opposed but did obviously uh, uh, agree to it as part of his appropriations committee, which adopted the final budget by 11-0 margin. Uh, there is a description over in the right column, and I touched on some of this stuff earlier, and gives a little greater detail in terms of uh, the, the numbers involved, the increases for state troopers, uh, for state police, and their uh, pay increases that have been promised over a long time that finally took, a, to, took a fruition. So that's the budget. Any comments that, that you'd like to make in addition to that, Dina? I would just like for everybody to recognize that Senator Kinley, uh, while he has done a great job uh, with the budget from the, from the Senate side, uh, was ultimately the individual that killed the cigarette tax increase. The House budget uh, had implemented a $1 per pack increase. Uh, that was, again, uh, written by Dr. Uh, Tim Brown, who is a representative out of Crawfordsville, but that, that did not make it into the Senate budget because, uh, again, as Jim noted, Senator Kinley does not like to do tax increases. So what I would encourage everyone to do is to ha start having conversations with your local senators with regards to what that tax increase looks like. Uh, it's and and talk about it in terms outside of it being a tax increase. It's an opportunity to help um, young people not start smoking uh, because of the um, cost of cigarettes. It's an opportunity to help folks with uh, limited resources stop smoking uh, because it doesn't fit into their budget. And it's an opportunity to change the overall uh, health climate in the state because the more folks that we get uh, away from smoking and um, uh, I guess I, I should say other tobacco use products, 
that provides Indiana a healthier uh, workforce, which provides an opportunity for economic development. So you really have to uh, start having the, the, pick, the conversation and creating a fuller picture. Um, healthcare may not be something that really resonates, but a healthier workforce should resonate and um, creating a, a more robust economy should certainly resonate uh, with those members. And, and thanks, Dan. And we'll, we'll look at actually that uh, house bill in just a few minutes near the end of this presentation. Um, moving on. Okay, there's three. Yeah, there's three that are, that are all kind of related. Uh, House Bill uh, 1002 and 1004 were vehicles that led to the ultimate passage in the, the, uh, for the funding in the actual budget. One was for the infrastructure funding, uh, which we talked about earlier in terms of the tax increase on gasoline and B&B funds, and then the expansion of the pre-kindergarten program, which originally was just going to be for five additional counties that was actually expanded to 20. So these two bills were essentially vehicles that led to the funding that appeared in the uh, final budget that was adopted by the General Assembly. Um, House Bill 1005 was a very controversial bill uh, that was the elimination of the uh, superintendent of public instruction as an elected official. Uh, as you can see, as you go across, there was not what you would describe as bipartisan support for this, uh, but it did eventually pass both uh, houses uh, what this does is it eliminates the uh, elected position for the superintendent of public instruction, and it becomes a governor appointee as of uh, 110 of 2025. So it's not something that's uh, going to go into effect until 25. And part of that is to allow for the current incumbent to be in, uh, have the opportunity to serve out their full terms. And some of this is the result of the contentious uh, relationship that happened in the prior administration uh, between the uh, Republican governor and the democratically elected superintendent of public instruction. Uh, there was a lot of issues between those two and obviously the Board of Education. Uh, this particular bill allowed for the governor to begin to appoint the superintendent of public instruction, which is obviously the biggest budget item every year and the biggest cost to state government is public, it's pu public education, both in the K through 12 and also in the uh, uh, universities, the state universities. This allows the governor to appoint an education uh, superintendent rather than have that elected. And obviously, uh, the, uh, the other side of the aisle did not agree with this and voted along party lines against that. Dean, anything you'd like to add to those three? No, thanks, Jim. Okay. All right, scrolling down. Uh, House Bill 1148 is, in my, to my knowledge, the first time Indiana has ever considered and adopted any type of legislation related to cannabis. And it's fairly limited in the scope of this. This is described for treatment of resistance for epilepsy. It allows for the use of cannabis to treat someone who's diff having, for treating someone who has uh, epilepsy and they're having uh, any type of problems with epilepsy and it's trying to reduce some of the, the effects of the epilepsy. I think it's somewhat interesting that, uh, that this passed uh, fairly, with fairly good uh, bipartisan support, recognizing the need that this kind of was a crack in the door a little bit toward cannabis, uh, the use of cannabis in the, in the state of Indiana. Now, this by no means Indiana is ready to uh, turn into Colorado or California or the Northwest and allow use of marijuana for uh, recreational use, but I think it is significant that the General Assembly, for the first time in its history, has adopted anything related to the use of cannabis and from a legal perspective. Dina? Uh, I think probably the only thing I will add to this is um, should one of your prescribers um, put this in place with one of their constituents, they need to also, I would encourage um, writing a note for that individual to carry on their person the, the, the they have the prescribed authority through their physician to have it on their person so as to protect themselves um, this is not something that is stipulated in the law um, but uh, as Jim noted we are still a very conservative state 
and um, I, I I think it would just um, it would provide a sense of comfort not only for the patient but it would also um, make the um, interaction between that patient and potential law enforcement should there be a question um, that um, it, it would just go much smoother. So uh, I will also note that when this passed the the um, floor and in the house, um, that uh, we were wondering if there was possibility of uh, seeing some kind of uh, opening of the of the heavens because uh, all of the lobbyists at the state house that day were uh, in sheer shock. It was it was a huge moment um, for uh, Indiana. That's for sure. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, moving on. One, it's a, one bill that was of particular interest to, certainly to RHA with our uh, Upper Midwest Resource Center, was the expansion of, of use of telemedicine. Uh, here again, if you go across the grid, you can see that this had widespread uh, support in both chambers. Uh, this allows or uh, requires state Medicaid to reimburse any provider that's using telemedicine for covered services. Uh, it eliminated, probably most importantly, eliminated the, the 20 mile uh, distance restrictions that had limited some use of telehealth, particularly on the Medicaid side, and it allowed telehealth use for the Healthy Indiana plan. So I think this was a significant uh, piece of legislation that passed for the benefit of rural Indiana to allow for the expansion of telehealth and certainly would help with uh, access to health care in areas in rural areas. Dina? I certainly think that this is a win for rural constituents. Um, I think that there's certainly a, a huge opportunity for rural providers to see exactly what kind of um, services that this will, would allow them to extend now to their population. And um, I think that uh, with, with the fact that we have some relatively decent reimbursement, I won't say great, um, I think that this becomes a, a more feasible tool uh, with this bill um, being passed. Good. Thank you. Jim, if we could, can we go, can we uh, take a minute and reflect on House Bill 1273? Well, 1273. I don't believe it's one that you have highlighted, but maybe one that we nonetheless... No, that's fine. Go, go right ahead. I, I, I don't have to highlight it. I have it on the grid. Go ahead. Yeah. So 1273 is um, going to be a health provider provider notice to covered individuals. Um, this, this bill was um, darn near unanimously um, passed. Um, it is, it, it, to me, um, it, it's a bit challenging, but nonetheless, uh, here we sit. It's going to require notice being given to patients receiving health care services that are outside of the network arrangements that they have in place. Um, and that is specifically, those, those, those notifications have to be made by their health care provider. So ultimately, a physician's office is going to have to um, recognize when they are sending a patient outside of their network. Um, this can be done a number of ways. Whatever works best within your provider offices um, it will suffice, whether that be during sign-in um, at, the, at the office or at the window that the patient is receiving services, but they, they could be potentially referred to services outside of their network by that provider. Um, it could be during the specific referral notice. Um, that the doctor has decided that they are going to refer them out. Um, there may be something that needs to be signed off on there. Uh, if there's something within their, the EMR that is in place that says a patient was notified that this, that this referral is outside of the network. Um, if there's a tablet that you are utilizing um, prior to seeing the patient that says, I recognize that my provider has the authority to refer me um, to an outside uh, entity, any of those practices to make sure that the provider is covered so that there are no repercussions should that patient be uh, referred outside of their network. So just something to have on your radar, uh, probably not something that has uh, been picked up on yet by your specific practices, 
but certainly something that you need to recognize and um, institute some kind of a policy within your um, within your hospital's um, practices. And, and I might add, I believe this is also kind of in conjunction or on the heels of legislation that's been passed in other states. I know Florida had something uh, recently, and I believe California also did something in this regard to out of network and notification. So it's not something that Indiana has taken on its own. I think it's following suit uh, for around the around the country. Jim, Dina, this is Allie. Um, we had a request from someone to discuss 1287, which I have also highlighted. But I do want to also say we are bumping up against the uh, one o'clock hour, and I understand that some people may have to go. Uh, we are recording today's presentation, so if there's part of it that you miss, again, we will have it posted uh, in the next 24 to 48 hours to the IRHA's YouTube channel. I am going to quickly send out the link to the survey uh, to follow up with today's meeting. Again, that data is very important for us to collect if we're going to be able to continue to have these free flex-funded programs. Also, if you have not sent to me through the chat function which facilities you're attending on behalf of, I would greatly appreciate that. That's also a piece of data that we like to collect. So um, I'll turn it back over to Jim and Dina at this time, but I did want to understand that some people may have to jump off. Uh, okay, thanks, Allie. I think the, the thing I understand about 1287 is that it was not merely an expansion of the CHOICE program, but a clarification of some of the provisions that are included in the CHOICE program. So I, I don't think it's a it wasn't a major or significant expansion or a change in a choice program, but just merely a clarification uh, to ensure that there, the various provisions of the choice program were maintained. Okay. All right. All right, let's move on to 1438. We're nearing the end, folks. I've got four more. Uh, 1438 was a very controversial bill that went through uh, with some difficulties, uh, with some opposition in both uh, both houses, but basically it, it allows or establishes the ability for local municipalities and counties to establish their own syringe exchange program uh, rather than rely on the state as it has been in the past to authorize any type of needle exchange programs uh, as a result, as a follow-up to the uh, incidents that occurred down in Scott County a few years ago. Uh, I know that uh, several counties have already been looking at implementing this. In fact, I'm going to Lafayette tomorrow, and I believe uh, Tippecanoe County is looking at ex uh, implementing an exchange uh, program for syringe uh, for syringes. And basically, the idea is to try to uh, eliminate as many dirty the the uh, handling of dirty uh, syringes among uh, either uh, drug users or other folks to try to eliminate as much problems with hepatitis C and HIV that was identified as an outcome of exchanging needles down in Scott County. Uh, Dina, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, Jim, thank you. So um, the needle exchange program is extremely contentious. Uh, Indiana Attorney General, um, he does not like this. Uh, he is a staunch conservative and uh, this passed um, with him having his head in his hands. Um, but I will tell you that, um, this program shouldn't just be about, and this is what we have tried to convey to other folks about the fact that the needle exchange program, it shouldn't be looked at as an endorsement, um, to drug usage. It should be looked at as an opportunity to, um, educate um, folks who have an addiction, and it should also be looked at as an opportunity to uh, reduce the cost within the community um, as far as treating folks uh, who end up with hepatitis, who end up with HIV, and who uh, could potentially end up with having AIDS then. Um, the, we've actually written a white paper on this about um, what those costs look like. Um, and ultimately, who ends up paying for those costs uh, should there be an outbreak like the one in Scott County? So, um, you know, taxpayers end up flipping the bill uh, when, when those kinds of things occur. So um, I would be happy to share that white paper with you. Um, it's something that um, needs to be 
and distributed not just within the context or the confines of your hospital, but your county commissioners, your city county council, um, folks who, uh, who are really challenged by this. And I know that there are a lot of folks who are, and to be perfectly honest with you, at one point in time, I had my reservations. But when you look at the dollars and cents, um, it's really hard to not understand where they're trying to go with this and what it could potentially mean um, cost-wise uh, to a community that does not have a lot of extra funds. Just drop me an email if you'd like to have that white paper. Good. Thanks, Dina. Okay, then I think our final three are on page 10 of the spreadsheet. Um, first was 1523, and I think this is significant, is that uh, this is the only bill that the governor vetoed. In my knowledge, it's the first time the governor's vetoed a bill in about three or four years. Uh, governor Holcomb actually went against his party on this one that originally had called for a charge uh, for uh, copying or for reproducing or producing uh, public records, the governor vetoed this bill saying that that should be a part of government service and it's consistent with this pillar talking about the the uh, optimum service that he wanted to do, provide great government service at a great value to taxpayers. It's consistent with that fifth pillar that he felt that uh, access to public records is something the government should do and not be at a charge. So he vetoed this bill late in the session and uh, a fairly significant uh, uh, event that a governor vetoes any bill particularly when he goes against his own party. Um, 1540, pharmacy law. This one is a somewhat significant in case there is a situation where uh, a catastrophe is in place or a disaster where there's a, a public health authority or could be this case could be the health commissioner, someone who's a licensed uh, prescriber who would be able to uh, basically issue an edict that uh, whatever for the public good, that those uh, uh, orders for immunizations or certain drugs or medical devices can be a standing order that those could be uh, provided in the, in the case of a situation that would be a public health crisis or, or a disaster. Uh, of course, that one had pretty widespread uh, support in both houses. And then the final one is 1578, which Dina touched on earlier. Uh, this was a an initiative by the so-called Health Alliance, which had several health leaders involved, asking to increase the cigarette tax uh, up to 250 a pack, uh, increase the smoking age from 18 to 21, and it would allow for an additional uh, uh, appropriations for the uh, the old TPC purposes for tobacco use prevention and cessation. Uh, this one got through the House. Uh, with some success in committee, then had some ran into some opposition on the floor, but did go into the Senate. And this one was then uh, uh, unable to get out of the uh, the Senate, uh, mainly to the influence uh, the influence of uh, Senator Kenley, which uh, Dina referred to earlier. So chances are, with the change in Senate leadership that will occur in 2018, this this likely would be uh, a bill that would be resurrected to that extent. Uh, we'll see, but I think it's something that obviously has some had some widespread support in the House, uh, and obviously did not even get out of committee in the Senate. Do you anything you'd like to add to those three? I don't think so, Jim. If I'd be happy to field any questions anybody has, I know we've run over on time. Okay. Any any other questions? I think we pretty recapsulated those bills pretty well. Say, so I'm happy to unmute the lines at this time. Uh, I do want to caution everybody uh, that, that may be on that I'm going to unmute everyone at once. So we may get a little bit of feedback at first. So uh, feel free to remute yourself if you need to, if you don't have a question to ask. Okay, the lines are open. If anyone has a question they would like to ask, um, I'm sending out the survey link one more time through the chat function. But at this point, uh, we're we're open to anyone.
And I did earlier have a question, which we've, we've touched on a few things, um, but somebody was wondering if either Jim or Dina could speak to how the any of the bills related to the opioid epidemic might reach more into the rural communities where the issue may be uh, worse than in urban areas. I know we've touched on that a bit as uh, we talked about some of the specific bills, but do either of you have anything you'd like to say to that point? I will just share, Allie, that um, there were a number of us that sat down with uh, Indiana Drug Sergeant McClellan and spoke to the challenges that were being seen in rural and um, there, there's severe shortage of resources. And during the context of our conversation, he did recognize that um, he was very well aware of the challenges in rural um, about with regards to the epidemic as well as resources. And um, he assured us that when provisions were made to get resources out, uh, that rural would not be forgotten, that he would lean uh, on the appropriate um, institutions within rural to help get those resources out. And we certainly extended uh, a helping hand uh, to Mr. McClelland and said, please let us know how we can support those efforts in getting the resources uh, out to our folks. So uh, when those opportunities are, are provided and, and whatnot, we will certainly be um, reaching out to communities to say, here's what we know, uh, here's how to uh, access, and uh, providing whatever means of support we possibly can to make sure that the, those resources get where they need to go. And, and Dean, I think he reiterated that when he made his preliminary findings back in May. Talking about Jim McClellan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Okay, not hearing any. I thank everybody, uh, especially those of you that, that were able to hang with us for another uh, 10 minutes. We know we went over and we do appreciate your time. Uh, again, the survey link is in the chat function. The recording will be posted to our web or our YouTube channel uh, in the next 24 to 48 hours. And if anybody has any questions, my email is aorwig at indianarha.org. And I will be sending out a copy of the spreadsheet. And also I will include the white paper that Dina mentioned as well. So with that, thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.